Hi everybody, I'm Roy Firestone and this is Facebook Live. You know, I used to love a broadcaster who broadcast for ABC by the name of Paul Harvey. He's been gone about 13 years, but I loved his show, The Rest of the Story. And with that in mind, like him, I love strange backstories about figures that we remember from childhood. And I like to hold the reveal, like he did, as to who it is till the very end. Now here is a fascinating one. He was really a very intelligent man, close to a Mensa student. Mensa means someone who scores at or above the 98th percentile on an IQ or other standardized intelligence tests. He attended, among other schools, Stetson College in Florida, where he not only ranked at the top of his class, he also starred in three different sports, especially basketball. He was six foot nine, a tremendous athlete. But he was more than that, too. He was also a top-level concert pianist, had a deep baritone singing voice that gave him a thriving career also in the radio business as a commercial announcer and newscaster. His baritone voice led him gigs in sci-fi films, but he really couldn't get many acting jobs because he was simply too tall. That's what the casting director said. They didn't like him against the stars being too tall. So he worked at a Dallas radio station, the esteemed WFAA, still around, which is still one of Dallas's most important broadcast stations. It's where he performed as a morning drive disc jockey, a newsman, a reporter. On November 22, 1963, he was the very first radio reporter in Dallas to report on President Kennedy getting shot. He was the first to get eyewitness accounts of the shooting and stayed on the air for WFAA for 11 hours. But you wouldn't know that because you don't know his past career as a journalist only his career as a very memorable TV character. He appeared in a lot of TV shows and had a short funny scene in Butch Cassidy the Sundance Kid when he got kicked in the groin by Paul Newman in a knife fight. But before that, you knew him as the unforgettable, creepy and funny character, Lurch. His name was Ted Cassidy. He was Lurch on The Addams Family, but he didn't live very long. Cassidy underwent surgery at St. Vincent Medical Center in Los Angeles to have a benign tumor removed from his heart the tumor had formed as a result of the long-term effects of a condition known as acromegaly, which was also responsible for the death of Andre the Giant. He had an iconic deep voice, did Ted. He had a facial structure, overall a tall stature. Well, the complications arose several days later while he was recuperating at home. He was readmitted to the hospital where he died January 16, 1979, at just the age of 46. Very short, successful life for the man millions remember as Lurch. You rang? You rang. <laughs> Here's another surprising story you may not know. Robert Max Weidman will turn 96 years old in March. You know him, but maybe not his real name. You probably don't know his amazing story. He was born almost 96 years ago in Paris, France, the youngest of 14 children. It was a Jewish family. Robert dreamed of being a cabaret singer as a little boy, and for a while he became well-known as a young entertainer in the City of Lights. But the happy life changed for Robert and his family and all other Jewish citizens in 1942 when the Nazis invaded Paris and took charge of the city. The Weidmans were arrested. They were sent to a concentration camp. It was the first of two different camps they were put in that year, along with tens of thousands of Jewish Parisians. When they were pulled off the train, Robert and his family experienced the most frightening and inhumane treatment they had ever encountered. Said Robert, we were not even human beings. When we got to Buchenwald, the SS shoved us into a shower room to spend the night. I'd heard the rumors about the dummy shower heads that were gas jets. I thought this is it, but it wasn't. It really was just a place to sleep, thank God. The first eight days there, the Germans kept us without a crumb to eat. We were hanging on to life by pure guts sleeping on each other, every morning waking up to find a new corpse next to you. The whole experience was a complete nightmare. The way they treated us, what we had to do to survive. We were less than animals. You know, sometimes I dream about those days, he said. I wake up in a sweat terrified for fear and I'm about to be sent away to another concentration camp. But I don't hold a grudge because that's a great waste of time. Yes. There's something dark in the human soul. For the most part, he said, human beings are not very nice. That's why when you find those who are nice, you cherish them.
Well, Robert somehow survived because the Nazi commandant in the death camp somehow found out he was a young singer and the commandant of Buchenwald spared his life because he entertained the SS in cabaret shows at night. The other 13 of Robert's brothers and sisters were taken away. He assumed they would be gassed. He believed he would never see them again. Robert's life literally hung by a song or a joke or show. As long as he could perform, for some reason the Nazis did spare him. In April 1945, the Americans liberated Buchenwald and Robert was saved. Most didn't survive. Almost all Jews were killed. And then miraculously, Robert learned that only three of his brothers and sisters weren't killed. Somehow they too survived. And for the rest of his life, Robert Weidman wrote and lectured about the horrors of the Holocaust. He continued to sing and act both in France and the United States. And then he was called to audition for a new TV show in 1965, a show about Nazis at a POW camp. But it wasn't a drama. It was a comedy. Much to Robert's astonishment, the show became a major hit on American television. It ran for 168 episodes from September 16, 1965 to April 4, 1971 on the CBS network, the longest broadcast run for an American television series inspired by that war. The show, Hogan's Heroes. The character played by Robert was Louis Lebeau, the French underground inmate in Stalag 13, the one with the funny Nazis. Well, interestingly enough, Robert became lifelong friends with the real-life Jewish members of the cast, Werner Klempner, John Banner. Almost every Nazi in the cast was played by a Jew. They were all Jews, the Nazis, in that series. Robert Clary is the man who will turn 96 years old in March. He still writes, he paints, he speaks about the Holocaust, and he knows there are no funny Nazis. He also knows that racism came out of hiding and white supremacists are more prominent and enabled in America than any time in his life. So you'll excuse him if he doesn't watch his own reruns on TV anymore. He lived it in real life. And Robert can tell you about real life and hate and being Jewish and what it is to be oppressed. And it's definitely not funny. One more. Dignity. If I could use only one word to describe Sidney Poitier, who died the other day at the age of 94, it would be that word, dignity. Because Poitier, who grew up in the Bahamas and once had a thick Bahamas accent and worked to tone it down, he always maintained in every role he played a great dignity and grace. He was the first black movie star. He was handsome and dashing and thoughtful in virtually every performance. And he was the first black actor to win an Oscar. Hetty McDaniel was the first Amer African American to win an Academy Award. Of course, she was a woman and that was in 1940. He played so many roles though, from Lilies of the Field, to In the Heat of the Night, to The Defiant Ones, Guess Who's Coming to Dinner, A Raisin in the Sun, to Sir with Love. They were all understated, elegant, and poised roles. He never played to stereotype or fad in his acting, despite being rejected by theater owners in the South who wouldn't even show many of his early films. <laughs> Dignity. Poitier wasn't merely a movie star, he was an activist too, not unlike his close friend Harry Belafonte and Cicely Tyson, who died last year, or Paul Robeson, who, unlike Poitier, believed that art had no role in changing segregation and civil rights. Poitier believed that every film he made had a purpose beyond box office. He believed his roles reflected his desire to see change and evolution in America, if not revolution in America. Poitier rarely performed comic roles, though he was capable of it, because he used his talent and standing in the industry to take on roles with gravity and relevance. His roles were authentic and appropriate for the changing times in the late 50s, early 60s, and early 70s. And his push to take on the roles with purpose paid off because almost every film he started showed a kind of nobility and loftiness. I would be hard pressed to think of many actors today who thought first that their roles impact to society and the cause of civil rights more than Sidney Poitier did in his time. He acted and later directed and he always seemed authentic in everything he did. He famously said, I am the me I choose to be. Now he had every right to be angry because he saw prejudice and discrimination throughout his life, but Poitier never saw himself as an angry actor or man. He said, quote, I've learned that I must find positive outlets for anger 
or it will destroy me. There's a certain anger. It reaches such intensity to express it fully would require homicidal rage, self-destruction, destroy the world rage, and its flame burns because the world is so unjust. But I have to find a way to channel that anger to the positive. And the highest positive is forgiveness. In his autobiography, A Measure of a Man, Poitier also showed deep humility for his life and his character. He said, you don't have to become something you're not to be better than you were. And then later he said, a person doesn't have to change who he is to become better. Well, I believe the arts and the world of film changed in part because of Sidney Poitier and people like him. He made his craft better. He made humanity better. He always kept his graceful, purposeful approach to everything he did, and he did it always with that word, dignity. I'm very excited about a new project I'm involved with called the National Sports Museum. It celebrates sports' profound impact on our national identity, pays tribute to socially conscious athletes who use their platform as leaders to affect meaningful change. You've got the opportunity to join me and others in becoming an NSM founding supporter. By the way, basketball legend Bill Walton is a, the newest advisory board member, and we're thrilled to have him joining this important project. You can donate by purchasing branded merchandise with the National Sports Museum founding supporter logo or simply by giving us a tax-deductible gift, if you'd like. They're also creating a painting of 23 iconic athlete activists, and I'll be auctioning that off at a virtual fundraiser hosted by me coming up this spring. All the details will be in the description below. Thanks for watching Facebook Live. I'm Roy Firestone. We'll see you next week.